my name is Mikkel White. I'm the campus pastor here at Sycamore Creek Church, South Lansing. Joining me this morning is Teresa Miller. Good morning. Looking sun-kissed from Florida. Um, <laughs> we have a shout-out question for you this morning. We're, we're doing Would You Rather Spring Edition. So would you rather be a squirrel for a day or a frog? Frogs. Okay, I like squirrel, obviously, because like then you can climb trees and jump and like they're pretty resilient little buggers. Oh, but I love the water, so you know, the frog <sighs> and the acronym fully relying on God. Yeah, there's not a there's that. not a cutesy acronym for squirrels, <laughs> no. but maybe one day. I can't we'll I, have to come up I, with I, one. Yeah, it, Okay, I'm holding you to that. We'll, we'll find it. She said, give me a week and I'll come up with one. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, would you stand with me this morning and let's, let's sing together.
the passion that God has for us that there's no wall he won't kick down. There's no lie in your life he won't tear down. And uh, the line in this song that says, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give your love away. But we do, because God says we do deserve it. And he does give himself away to us. And that is just one of the most amazing truths that we can sit with and live with and trying to incorporate into our lives. Amen. Through it all, through it all, my eyes 
may be seated. And kids, it's time for Kids Creek, so you can head on back and float on down the river. They're gonna have so much fun. Kids Creek is so fun. Like, you should check it out sometime. If, you know, whatever. Okay. Um, we've got programs. Yeah, in go that ahead program. and pull them out. If you didn't get one, go back and grab one. And we want you to start filling out the connection card, and we're going to refer to this a little bit later. Yeah. Yep. Uh, then pull out your cell phone, snap a selfie. Here we go. And then post that to your social media with the hashtag SCCMI, or you can tag us on Instagram. Our selfie this week is Mickey. Hey, yay. <laughs> yeah, so you get a $5 Bigby gift card if you're chosen to be selfie of the week. So go ahead and post that and tag us. Or if you are really like against social media or you don't have it, then you can always email us to be considered. But, you know. This is like a way of, of letting people know that you're a safe person to talk to about church and spiritual stuff. So like if, you're, if your friends are like, huh, I'm looking for a place, I don't know what to think, I don't know where to go, and they see you post this photo, then they know you're a person that they can go and talk to and ask about, hey, what's your church like? What, what, what kind of people do you hang out with and stuff like that, so. Mm -hmm. It's cool. And it's cool. I also think it's cool that on the 517 Facebook page and somebody ask about a church, I'll scroll through and how many times I'll see the Sycamore yep. Creek. Somebody yep. has Pretty responded, and mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. I think that's cool, too. We uh, started this series last week. It's called The Good News for the Person Who Has Everything. I'm sure you've all heard the stereotypes about religion and spiritual things and Christianity that is really just a crutch for weak people, that it's really just for people who need something to, to rely on. And so this series is sort of addressing those stereotypes the good news for the person who has everything. And this morning, our message begins with this. If you're not sick or poor, what does Jesus have to do with you? Is religion really just a crutch for weak-minded people? Or is there something more? In this five-week series, you can find answers to the question, what is the good news for the person who has everything? Do you have a favorite inspirational quote? Something that's like, you know, we've all heard these things, like work hard and play hard. Like if you want something, you just got to keep working. Like you just got to keep going. You got to like do all the things, right? I'm sure you've heard these. A quick Google search showed me a few of these. The greatest pleasure in life is doing what people say you cannot do. That might be an Enneagram 8, if you know, if you know anything. Okay. Yeah. Some of you got it, some of you don't. Okay, uh, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So just put a little sweat equity in and, and like you can be a genius too, right? Uh, there are no shortcuts to any place worth going. So you have to go the long way around and work really hard and then maybe you can get where you want to go. Or <laughs> how about this cold dose of reality? Uh, there's, there's an... Instagram social media phenomenon where people are talking about like, this is a stereotype, men think about the Roman Empire like all the time. I don't know if that's true. I've never had a conversation, John Reich says no. Um, I don't know if that's legit, but there was this thing where people were like, oh my gosh, yeah, I think about the Roman Empire all the time. And so then women would respond and be like, well, my Roman Empire is this. The fact that personal development books marketed to women are shelved in the self-help section, but books on similar topics marketed to men are in the leadership section. That's interesting. She, by the way, Tracy G, is amazing, and she's got a, a personal development book coming out soon, so you should check that out. It's great. Um, but that, that's just weird, right? Like, it, it's weird how that happens. Um, we're surrounded by this message all of these messages about working hard and personal development, and you just got to earn it. Like, it's not really a win if you didn't work really hard to get there. There's a temptation 
right, than to bring that to all aspects of our life, including our faith, right? So then we start to think that there's a way to earn God's favor. It's especially appealing, I think, to people who are from, like, white middle-class backgrounds, our, our Depression-era parents and grandparents instilled these values, like the Protestant work ethic, which is work really hard, and then you'll get ahead, and, and, and you can get anything, basically, in life, anything you want with dedication, education, and persistence. And many of us become so convinced of all this that we bring it to every aspect of our lives, even our faith. And then we, we open our Bibles, and we start to look, and we come to, to like a worship service, and we hear messages, and sometimes what we hear and what we read can seem to confirm that, that what we really need is some kind of big, grand gesture. You might be familiar with a story called The Rich Young Ruler. This is a, a young man who approaches Jesus, and he's like, hey, good teacher, what do I need to do to like get into heaven? Like, what, 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 how, how do I get there? And Jesus gives him this list of like, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not commit murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. All that stuff. And he's like, check, check, check. I did all that. I'm good. And then Jesus says, well, yeah, one more thing. Sell everything you have. Give the money to the poor and then come and follow me. It looks like God is, Jesus is asking this man for some grand gesture to earn his way into the club, right? That, that's what it, it seems like. And so then our minds just fill in the blank. Surely I also have to do something drastic. Surely I have to prove my love for God in order to be accepted into the club. But the message of the good news of the message of Christ is good news about a status which we already have with God, which we don't need to earn and you can't work for. It reminds me of that song that we just sang. You can't work to earn the right to be your father and mother's child. You already are that child. Like, we already are the children of God. We don't have to work to earn that status. So then the question that we're facing is not what can we do to get to God to love us. Our problem is what can we do in light of God's love for us, in light of the love that God already has for us, how are we responding? So like maybe Jesus was inviting the rich young ruler to live in response to God's love, in freedom from greed, in freedom from a scarcity mindset, in freedom from a desire to hoard things on earth rather than building a treasure in heaven. Maybe it was an invitation to freedom. And what if you don't need to earn God's love? What if you don't need to do anything to earn God's love? What if it's already yours? Because here's the thing. Jesus is the answer, which makes the question, what must I do to be saved, irrelevant and unnecessary? Jesus is the answer, which makes the question, what must I do to be saved, irrelevant and unnecessary. We're in this series, The Good News for the Person Who Has Everything. It's based on a book by Will Willimon called The Gospel for the Person Who Has Everything. The gospel is just a fancy Christianese word for good news. So it's the good news for the person who has everything. And we have this book in the micro bookstore. I think there's one more copy back there. Uh, so you can check that out. Um, and it's also, you know, for sale on Amazon and like you can order it through your local bookstore and whatever. Uh, we began last week asking this question, do I have to be weak in order to get the good news? Spoiler alert, no, you don't. But you can also go and watch that, that message. It was a pretty good one. Uh, this week we're talking about uh, how the good news is already yours. Next week we're going to explore that the good news is a gift to be used. And that it leads then, the next week, to a life of gratitude. And then we're asking the question, do I have to do this on my own, or can I do this on my own to live in light of the good news? So today, I wonder how things might shift for you in your life, and how you live in your everyday, the ways you're going about the world. How would your faith change if you came to the realization that you don't have to earn God's favor, that it's already yours? How might that change your faith? What if 
What if it's only when we sense the permanence of God's love that we recognize our own fickleness? Like, it's only in light of God's faithfulness that we recognize how unfaithful we really are. What if it's only when we sense the truth in God that we can see the falsehood in ourselves and the ways that we kind of hide and, and, and sugarcoat and like cover up the truth sometimes? What if, what if only Christians can really be sinners because we're the only ones who can like actually acknowledge and see the ways that we fall short? What, what would that be like? How, how would that change our faith if, if we came to some of those realizations? Let's stop here for a chat question. This is something we do here at Sycamore Creek. We'll pause throughout the message. So you're going to turn to someone. If you're joining us online, you can put this in the chat. Where have you noticed the message that you have to work hard to earn success or even to earn love? Take a minute and, and let's talk about that. I don't know about you, but I feel like this message is so ubiquitous. It's like so all over the place. It's kind of hard to come up with like one specific example, or, or maybe that was just me. But like I, I thought of um, when I was graduating from high school, I had this idea that like I had to go to a four-year college. Like that was the path to success. That was the path to like, I mean, I even remember someone telling me, like, it's not so much even about the degree you, d you get, but that proving that you can do it, that you yeah. can, like, stick through it, and, like, that shows something about whatever, whatever, and it was, like, that was the path. How about you, Teresa? Um, the thing that came to mind, that having worked in several uh, multi-level marketing things, is like, okay, every day you have to make 20 contacts, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, and you have to follow up four times, and, and you know, at the end of the month, you're going to make a lot of money. Yeah, it was like a formula, like, yeah, you, you just know, do you these just specific do these things, things, and, then and you good. work hard enough, and you will be successful. Yeah. Oof, oof. So this message of hard work and uh, to earn things, it's, it's just all over the place. So we're, we're going to look at a story that, like, from the gospel, from the story of Jesus' life and, and ministry, um, that will help us to see a sort of different way uh, of going about being in this world, uh, as sort of a counterpoint. We're going to look at the parable of the two sons. You might hear this referred to as the parable of the prodigal son, um, and, and this is from Luke's account of Jesus' life and ministry. To illustrate the point, point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father, his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. 
He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. So I, I, I want to just like share some context with you that will help. This is a, a Rembrandt uh, painting of this story. Um, but to start with, this younger son, when he's requesting his share of the estate, he's requesting his inheritance, he's basically saying, like, Dad, I wish you were dead. Let, let's cut to the end. Let's cut to the chase. Like, let's get to the ending. I'd like your money. I'm done. Like, my relationship with you doesn't really matter. I'd rather have the things that you can give me. It's a big deal. And then he goes to this other place, and he wastes the money and wild living. He's incredibly irresponsible. And, and then the thing with the pigs, we don't have really the same kind of taboo things here in, in our culture. And so it's hard for us to wrap our heads around really how bad this is. Um, it's, it's not quite the same because like any one of us might be like go to ride a horse, right? But eating horses would be taboo. Right? Other parts of the world might eat horse meat or dog meat or other kinds of meat, and we're like, no, like that's like off limits. So imagine that feeling, but like you can't even be around that animal either because it would make you unclean. That's what we're talking about with the sun being with the pigs, okay? So this is like, it's, it's off limits. It's shameful, it's awful, it's disgraceful. That's what the son is doing when he's with the pigs. When he finally came to his senses, another, another version of this uh, says when he came to himself, which I really like. I like that. Like he came to his self. He, he remembered himself. And he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned both against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home. This is a Kelly Lattimore uh, icon image of, of this story. He says, when he came to his senses, when he came to his self, so he had this realization that the father had the resources that he needed to survive. And he recognizes that being a servant under his father's care would be better, would be a better position than where he's at right now. At this point, he's ready to accept that role of a servant because he recognizes that his father has the resources he needs to survive. He knows that his father is the answer. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for the son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. The son came to himself, remembering his father's resources. The, the boy already had access to those resources uh, as his father's son, but he, he hadn't been living like it. He hadn't been in touch with those resources. And so now the son is ready to make amends. But the father runs out to him, leading with love. The, fa the father is far more interested in finally having his son back home than he's concerned with whatever words the son might have to express his, his regret and his remorse. The son expects to be treated like a pauper, but the father welcomes him as a prince, puts a ring on his finger and a robe on him and sandals. This is the good news for the younger son. The son first remembers the father is the answer. The father has the resources he needs. The father is the answer. And then the son senses his problem. He remembers. He comes to himself. Oh my gosh, 
I can, I can just return home and I will have what I need. And then the son repents and turns home, finding that the father's love is greater and deeper and more like unconditional than he ever could have imagined. So even though the son clearly has problems, the beginning of this story is realizing that he already has the answer. The love of his father is already his, and his position as the son is secure. He didn't have to earn his father's love, and you don't have to earn God's love. It's already yours. If your life has obvious problems, Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. And if your life is pretty good, Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. And in either case, there's still an invitation to respond, right? The younger son had those obvious problems. He found the father was the solution, but he needed to make that trek home and accept it and begin living like that. He responds to his father's love in that way. Now, the older brother, the older son, is experiencing his brother's return in a very different way. The older son was in the fields working, and when he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house, and he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. Calf, We're celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years, I've slaved for you. I've worked like a servant and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Now, the older brother's life was actually pretty good, right? Like, he was still under the protection of his father. He was still, like, safe, enjoying all these resources. He was fed. He never left home. And still, there was an opportunity for him to respond, to, to live in this way, right? Right? And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed with by me, and everything I have is yours. My resources are already yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your father was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Side note, if you think about the fact that there's two sons, and the younger son already got his share of the estate, the older son... Everything, literally, everything left is his. So when he's saying, like, everything I have is yours, literally, like, it's all the older brothers. Now, the younger son obviously had problems. He had obvious problems. His father was the answer, and he already loved him. And the older brother's life looked pretty good, and still, the father was the answer, and he already loved him. Let's take a moment just to reflect on this, this story and this idea, a lot of times when we hear this story told, it's, the focus is the younger brother. He's called the prodigal son. But I, I find it so helpful to reflect on the invitation to the older brother as well. Many of us are like the older brother, and our lives look pretty good, and we miss the invitation. And I think it's really interesting, too, to think about the father in this story, how the father is looking for the sons, is, is looking for uh, the sons to come home. I've heard this story sometimes referred to as the prodigal God, because prodigal really just means like generous, like, what, like reckless. So like when we think about reckless love, that song, that's really talking about like the reckless love, the generous, the prodigal love of God for us. So let's, let's pause here and just reflect Turn to someone around you. If you're joining us online, putting it, put it in the chat. Take a moment to reflect on the story of the two sons, and then what character do you resonate with most? Where do you find yourself in this story? Let's take a minute and reflect on it.
Well, it's probably no surprise that I resonate with the older son. Um, I feel like just that idea, well, I have a lot of oldest child. <laughs> I have a lot of, sorry, Nathan just gave me an A+, plus, um, which is what I live for. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's distracting. I feel like you did that on purpose to distract me. Okay. Um, oh, my gosh. I have a lot of oldest child tendencies, and uh, sometimes people are still surprised to find out that I'm the third out of four. I'm not the oldest child because I so just... Are you the oldest girl? No, no. I'm the baby girl. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, do, <laughs> I have theories, but the point is I have a lot of oldest child <laughs> tendencies, and I have often wanted to like do, like do earn the thing. And so like we were talking about the injustice of like this younger son coming yeah, home. Yeah, the right and wrong. Yeah, and there's like a part of me that want like, wait, but I did all of this. Why, why is he getting the party, you know? Is that how you feel sometimes too? It is. It's, and yet, at some point in the last so many years, I've really come to understand and will start my prayer time a lot of times, Lord, thank you for loving me in spite of myself. Mm -hmm that there isn't anything I can do to earn his love and just need to rest in it. Yeah. And, you know, I would say this is not, there's no easy answer no, to this. No, there's not an easy answer. But I think it's helpful to reflect on it. It's still helpful for me even now to, like, reflect back on it. Okay, where do I see myself in the story? And what is God's invitation to me right now? So again, the invitation for us is, like, if your life has obvious problems, Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. And if your life is pretty good, Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. So what would change in your life if the foundation of your faith was that Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you? I think it would lead probably to a more mature faith one that's rooted in God's love for you? Because this, this foundation, it changes things. Uh, and in light of that, when Jesus says to his disciples that they must become like little children in order to enter the kingdom of God, I think it's about living like a child who knows that they're loved by their parents and can rest in that. And that leads to more maturity, actually. Because you're not going to have a mature faith unless you're completely rooted in and grounded in God's love for you. So let's look at this. The, the first sort of marks of like immature versus mature faith. Immature faith is polarized thinking versus mature faith, which is perspective taking. Polarized thinking is like being stuck in either or. Things are either wrong or they're right. They're either good or they're bad. And there's no in between. And on the outside, it can look really confident. Like, I know things. I know what's good and I know what's bad. And like, I know it. Right? There's like, it looks like confidence. Um, it looks like having all the answers. But on the inside, it's really an intolerance for knowing things or for not knowing things yet. Like, which means that it's hard to learn new things. It's hard to grow. It's hard to change. And it, that just makes it like difficult, like I said, to grow. And then perspective taking, on the other hand, is part of a faith that's so rooted in God's love that it's not threatening to look at things from other perspectives, to, to learn new things, to see things from a different way, to be challenged. It's willing to learn by considering other ideas and stepping back to evaluate its own claims. And it's really crucial because the reality of life is that it's messy. It's messy. Life has hardship. Life will throw you curveballs that will disrupt the sense that you've made out of life. And then in order to move forward, you have to like, make new sense out of life. Incorporate new information. Consider other ways of living out your faith. And there's a good chance that something that can't bend will break. So you have to be able to learn and grow and, and take perspective take. And then formulaic thinking versus freedom. 
Formulaic thinking is like saying A plus B equals C. All the time, every time, no exceptions. If you call, make 20 contacts and follow up, you will earn money. If you give abundantly, like to the church, you will be blessed 10 out of 10 times, every time, no exception. And that's dangerous, actually. Like, yes, we are called to live like, in freedom and generosity. And that kind of A plus B equals C formulaic thinking is damaging for at least two reasons that I can think of. One is that it can be used in high control religious settings to manipulate people who live in poverty to give more than they can afford with the promise of them getting it back. Like it's some kind of investment firm, right? And the second thing that's, that's problematic with this is that it, it takes something that is really mysterious, like miracles and, and God's generous provision, and turns it into something that's magic. You do this and this and this, and you can get God to give you what you need, to give you what you want. You can force God's hand because there's this formula that if you follow it, God will do this. And that that's not really a life of like trust and love and relationship. That's a vending machine, right? On the other hand is freedom. So out of a strong sense of God's love for us, we can experience freedom from fear, knowing that God loves us even if we make mistakes, even when we don't get it right, even when we don't even live up to our own standards. God loves us. And so we can try to do the right thing. We can work toward being more like Jesus from a foundation of knowing that it's because God loves us. It's like living out of God's love, not for God's love, you know? And then this, this includes a freedom to be misunderstood, to know that people are not always going to understand you. They're going to misinterpret you. They're, they're going to assign intention to you that is not what you mean. Like, this, this is a life of freedom and faith. And as long as we're rooted in God's love for us, we, we can handle that. We, we can accept that. Third is uh, certainty in a person versus embrace, faith that embraces questions. So certainty in a person, we're not talking about like certainty in Jesus, we're talking about like certainty in like a, a, a human that you know, right? And so this could be... Um, Someone is like someone who you reach out and touch who can be the answer button in your life. That could be a well-meaning pastor, or they could be a cult leader. This could be your parent, or it could be a predator. Like, it's really, it's sort of about the person, but it's really more so about, like, are you giving up your agency? Have you checked your brain at the door so that this person will have all the answers for you? There, that's the danger in it, because you're not engaging. You're not, like, taking ownership of your own faith, of your own life, of your own stuff. You're, you're just letting that person, like, I don't want to be that person for you. I'm not your answer button. <laughs> like, I'm not a good answer button. Um, so, like, yeah, okay, you know what I'm saying. All right, on the flip side, a mature faith is one that embraces questions, like, I mean, we, we have said here at Sycamore Creek, like, you don't have to check your brains at the door. Like, bring your questions, bring your thoughts, bring your ideas, wrestle with this. Know that I'm wrestling with stuff, too. Like, we all do. We all have questions. We all have doubts. We all have things that we're working through, and you don't have to hide those away. You can bring them. We recognize that part of mature faith is leaning into this. Like this way of living that doesn't require those firm assurances. That we can live without all of our questions. Like we bring our questions and we know that they might not all be answered. Right? Like there's like a, like a, a weird tension there of like, oh man, I want to bring my question. I want to wrestle with it. And I know I might not have certainty about the answer. We can embrace those questions. And as a bonus, a, a mature faith involves freedom to be gracious and giving because we don't have to live with a scarcity mindset. We know that God's love is so abundant and so we can live abundantly. We're concerned about the welfare of other people 
And what might sometimes start as concern with like myself and my own well-being and like what I'm getting out of this faith should then lead to and grow into, I'm also concerned about other people and their well-being and, and how they're doing and how they're thriving as well. We move from I to you. So let's stop for one more chat question. Turn to someone around you, if you're joining us online, put it into the in the chat. Where has your faith allowed you to be more gracious and giving? And, and it, that doesn't have to be financial. Gracious is a lot about just your posture to other people. So let's take a minute and talk about that. <laughs> I, I love, I mean, I kind of love this question because it can lead in so many different places. Like, Teresa, you want to share what you were sharing with me? I said, I've, re I've seen this question now for a few days and have kind of struggled with it. And it's like, well, I think I am more gracious with people that I meet in the street and, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm walking just to say hello um, or a cute purse, or, you know, love your shoes, or just to give that compliment without the fear of them hurting me. Mm -hmm. And, it's, you know, you don't talk to strangers kind of thing is in the back of my head, and yet I think I have gotten better at just a quick hello, have a great day, you know, that sort of thing. And we all need positive up uplift every day. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a great way of like your faith and like informing and helping you grow and and how you're interacting with people. I thought about um, like that my faith allows me to be more gracious in like what conclusions we come to. Like I don't have to force you to the same conclusion that I've come to, or like we don't all have to be on the same page. Like we can have different opinions and different perspectives, and like that's okay. Um, I. It's taken a lot of growth and therapy to get there, but my faith has been an important part of that too, for like uh, just not being threatened by other perspectives and, and being able to perspective take. So that's kind of fun. Um, so this mindset of working hard and earning success and desires and rest, it's everywhere. Surely I'm not the only person who feels a vague sense of guilt for resting. Mm -hmm. Like, do you ever feel like, okay, I got to work really hard to earn the rest? You don't have to, by the way. You can just rest when you want to. It's not fun. Like, you can just, like, take a rest and you don't have to earn it. <laughs> That's good news. Okay. Anyways, this is our good news. You don't have to do anything special for God to want to have a relationship with you. You don't have to do anything special for God to want to have a relationship with you. You don't have to work hard to convince Jesus to go the extra mile for you. Jesus already did that. You don't have to earn God's love. It's already yours. The younger son in the story from Luke's gospel, he realized this. 
He realized that the, the father was the answer. And then he sensed his problem, and then he, he returned home and repented, finding that his father's love was deeper and more gracious than he ever imagined. His father's love was already his. And our good news is that if your life has obvious problems, Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. And if your life is pretty good right now, Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. No matter where you're at this morning, whether your life is falling apart around you, or if you feel like things are really going pretty well, God loves you so much. And you don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to do anything to, to get this love. God already loves you. And there's this invitation to grow in gratitude and compassion and love for the people around you in response to God's love for you. Jesus is the answer, and he already loves you. And that's really good news. I love that. Um, So we're going to talk about some ways that we can connect this morning and that we can all together uh, get, like, live into God's love for us. Um, The first way is by connecting with each other. Pull your cards back out. And look on the back. There's a couple things that we can do. Uh, Read the book. Um, She said there's one copy back there. Go ahead and order it. I tend to read on Kindles, so... Mm -hmm. um, Though I did find while being at the beach, a real book is easier to read with sunglasses on. That's true. But they're a a pain to carry everywhere. So, you know, there's give and take. Uh, Read and reflect the story of the two sons in Luke 15. Um, Spend more time thinking about which one do you relate to. Maybe you need to change thinking. Uh, Isn't that what we're challenged to? Yeah. And then you are going to Subway for lunch today. That's right. Yeah, so we have a meet and eat today right after the church service. This is really for like folks who um, are kind of new to our community or uh, haven't really gotten a chance to get to know me. Um, Join me. And uh, I might even buy your lunch. So come on out. And it's just right across the street, right over there. Um, And then you can also put your prayer requests on this card if you want, and then just drop them in the blue buckets at the end of your row. Um, Last week, we had this in our programs. I'm glad to see this. I like being able to put those dates on my calendar Mm -hmm. um, ahead of time. If you didn't get one last week, Elvia has some more cards, so you can get one. There's also some on the the table back there. Um, So you can put this on your fridge. This really is like... If you would like to know when we will not be in this building. You know, it is kind of cool when all the churches get together. Yep. Um, you know, we certainly have friends that were here and now are at Eastwood or at Potterville. And to be all together for one church, I kind of look forward to those times. I think they're really fun. And so there's a, there's a few times here. There's May 26th, all of July, and also September First, where we will not be in this building, we'll be all three campuses together. So um, put this on your fridge so that you don't show up here on those days. And you're like, where is everybody? <laughs> or the wrong location. Did the oh, rapture I happen and I didn't know? <laughs> <laughs> Who else has church trauma? <laughs> okay. All right. So grab one of those. Keep hold of it. Um, We have lots of ways that you can give this morning. You can scan this QR code. You can go to the website. Um, You can, if you have something with you, you can drop it in the bucket at the end of your row. However you choose to give this morning, we're so thankful for for your gifts. Um, Today we're celebrating what your giving has done, that we had church Easter in Buddies. Um, We had a great time. We had a great turnout, and those are always so much fun. Um, I like to bribe my kids to come with food, so, you know, food and a phone. (laughs) They're pretty good, Um, but thank you. Like, your giving helped make possible that we purchased, like, burgers and fries for all of the first-time guests who were there, and so that's just a way that we welcome folks, a way that we, um, you know, make that a safe space for people to come and hang out. So thank you. 
Uh, we have one more shout out question for you today. What is one of your favorite local restaurants? Zaytun. People's Kitchen. Sunshine Diner. All right. Uh, Old Bag of Nails is a solid choice for us. City Limits. All right. So if you need more uh, like recommendations, you heard some, go talk to some people, find out where you should go and support local. So, yes. yeah. All right. Would you stand with me as you're able and let's, let's sing one more, a couple more songs together.
one more to get us out the door and keep us energized the whole week as we think about how we don't have to do anything for God to love us. And that is like the greatest news ever. Does anybody in here need love? Show of hands, there's at least 10 of you. So that's good. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> Join me in singing Holy Water. so good to see you. I hope to see you next week as we continue our series with episode three. Um, and this is also all three of us preaching. So it's like three, three square. You know, I don't know. Whatever. Um, join us next week. And until then, be curious, be creative, and be compassionate, and go in peace.